Hello, <laughs> I'm Ian McCarty and um, tonight I'm going to talk to you about some of the interesting things that we found this this last summer with the Komenyarty Skiravak archaeology works. Um, we found a lot of sites, so I've chopped it down to a few themes that hopefully most folk will find interesting. And they are the Garagdu, the Shilin's Orari, and Illicit Stills, and a few other little mysteries. So here we go. The first thing I'd like to say is that all of this wasn't my idea. It was this man, <laughs> D.I. or Don, as others know him, Vice Chair of the Komiakti. D.I. planned, advertised and organised all the routes and was always present to make sure everything ran smoothly. So first of, all, first of all, I'd like to say a big thanks to him for involving me and also congratulating him on doing such a good job. This initiative um, solidified my impression that you Bacchus are certainly not backward about coming forward. Secondly, I would like to say that I'm not claiming to be any kind of general expert in Skiravak. I'm just an archaeologist with a very specific skill set and knowledge base. However, I hope that with these I will be able to add something to the overall picture, especially when combined with other sources, especially local knowledge. Thirdly, I'd also like to take this chance to apologise for my lack of Gaelic. I am learning, but slowly, so I hope that I don't mangle their place names too badly. And fourthly, please, please get in touch with the common Yachty if you have anything to add or if you disagree with anything which is said uh, forthwith, because this, this is an inclusive endeavour. So, uh, the experience has been particularly interesting for many reasons for me, but my, my favourite is that it extracted archaeology from its ivory tower and enabled it to mix with people's lived experience. Old records were literally dusted off, i.e. printed out, as you can see here, and taken for a walk, and at the correct place in the landscape, they were informed and enhanced by the stories from the community. This is good because the national records as they stand are mostly made by Ordnance Survey surveyors in the 1800s. These men were incredibly skilled and hard working, but they were not local and they did not have local concerns in mind. Ordnance, of course, means guns and the Ordnance Survey's original remit was to survey the Highlands after the 1745 rebellion to ensure that it didn't happen again, i.e. to dominate the area. The Hebrides were one of the first places to be surveyed, along with the Republic of Ireland. Having said all that, their records are very useful. One particularly useful aspect of their work is that they did it twice, once around 1840 to 50 and again around 1890. This allows us to see a snapshot of change of the landscape. However, alone they, they do not comprise a realistic reflection of the sites of this area. For example, in our walks, there were supposed sites that were not recorded, but which we, sorry, there were sites, supposed sites that were recorded, but which did not actually exist sites that were recorded in the wrong place, sites which we were shown by members of the community which were unrecorded, and sites which we came across that no one knew of at all. In this way, the project gathered information about the back area which greatly enhances the national records held in Edinburgh, as it means that these records are being written by local people with local knowledge and local interests. Each individual work has been written up and is available through the CBAC website, and now uh, apparently even as a booklet. So as I said tonight, I thought I would explore a couple of interesting themes that have crystallized from the experience as a whole. So these are the Garak Du, uh, Shealing Sites and Their Evolution, Illicit Stills, and some other little interesting little mysteries. So we'll start off with the Garak Du. As I'm sure you'll know, there are many Garak Du or black dikes out in the moor created by digging a deep ditch in the peat and making a peat wall with the resultant spoil. The biggest and most famous runs all the way from Ness to Carloway as seen in this slide. But every village will probably have them in some form. They are a system for managing livestock, also sometimes known as head dikes, which function to exclude animals from the fertile areas for growing crops during the growing season. We don't know how old these are, as they have never been scientifically dated. Indeed, this would be difficult to do. We do know, however, that they are older than the Ordnance Survey first edition in 1849 to 52, and are probably quite a lot older 
as although they are marked upon these maps as lines, they are not annotated as head dikes or anything similar. They seem to have already fallen out of use, or perhaps the surveyors just didn't know what they were and weren't told. <laughs> Dr. Mary McLeod, the ex Coralie archaeologist, has suggested that some could be almost as old as the peak formation itself, which commenced sometime around 3,000 years ago in the late Bronze Age, around 2000 BC, or 1000 BC, sorry. Intriguingly, they do seem to run very close to ancient Neolithic burial cairns in many places, both here in Back and in Bragger, but that's according to Anne Campbell from Bragger. But this coincidence could be for many reasons and does not necessarily imply that they are contemporary. Um, our inquiry into the Garag Du is unfinished, but already handsomely repaid. Um, the scale of the earthworks walk so far is nothing less than monumental, and we haven't even explored half of them yet. Our quest began near Loch Ben Iver, where we saw the place name Shea Na Garag Du, Fairy Knoll of the Garag Du. That's the right hand arrow in this slide. <clears throat> um, so it suggested that the Garag Du was nearby, but where was it um, and what would it look like now? And so DI enlisted some local knowledge and we were, when we came to do the walk, we were lucky to be joined by Seamus MacArthur, a crofter who had worked sheep in this area all his life and knew it intimately. Seamus took us to the exact location and together we began to trace the line of the dike out into the moor. Uh, we picked it up, running from the Ave Vor up and into Loch Ben Iver. Um, that's the left hand arrow in the last um, slide, then carrying on the other side of Loch Beneaver before carrying out into the moor, carrying on out into the moor. So here in this slide, you can see that the water there is the deep ditch running to the side of it. And the dike is just the low remains to the right hand side. And it, we followed it out. You can see it here. We followed it out in the way out into the moor. And here you can see it, it's really deep. The ditch is two, like two meters deep, easily. So it's a, a sub, like a substantial um, barrier. And that's Seamus there. And here you can see um, the blue line that crosses the Fedan of Loch Korsovat, the outlet of Loch Korsovat there. See the blue line that crosses at right angles. Um, a blue line is supposed to denote a water course on the OS, um, but they, obviously this one's very straight. And if you look closely, it goes uphill and downhill. <laughs> so this isn't a water course at all. It's not a stream. This is the line of the dike with its ditch. Interestingly, there was a dam on the Fedon of Loch Korsova at this point, most probably intended to raise the loch levels artificially high so that they could be opened and let a flood down to the water, down to the mill that's lowered downstream. <clears throat> this was the original horizontal mill operating before the big vertical mill of Gress Farm. And uh, the next slide here is that blue line that you can see crossing the fed the end of La Corsovat. So you can see the line of the Garag Du there. And then this slide you can see it from the aerial imagery. You can see the line crossing and going uphill and downhill and away out into the moor. And then again, here you can see it on the first edition, 1852. And this, so this red line here is uh, the Garag Du, uh, or just to the side of it is the Garag Du as we have traced it here. There's Loch Beneva, and we traced out right angle bend and it goes off shoots away off towards Murnag. Uh, on our third walk, we crossed a section of the Garag Du again as we followed a similar dike that ran at 90 degrees to it, radiating out from the centre of the village. And this is the blue lines, the light blue and the dark blue lines in this slide here. This dike starts at the Gress Farm Head Dike near the old mission house on the top of the road, in, on the top road in Gress and headed northwest into the moor. Below or inside the Garag Du, that is the light blue line, it's called the Garag Drum Brai and Ulche, or the wall of the rising ground above the stream. Outside of the Garag Du, that's the dark blue line, a separate but almost continuous wall carrying out 
into the moor on a slightly different alignment is called the Garag Mianoich, or the Midnight Wall. Garag Mianoich. So, the Midnight Wall. So, uh, this slide is the, um, sorry, is the light blue line. The, it's the um, Garag Drum Brian Oach, huh? heading out from the Mission House. And then, <laughs> this is the start of uh, the Garag Mianoich. There we go. There's the midnight wall proper. So you can see there's a ditch either side of the massive bank in the middle. And then all of a sudden it stops. <laughs> in the middle of the moor, it just comes to an end. So uh, here we go. This is, um, this, we've got two oral traditions, two slightly different oral traditions. This is Murdo Styles. So uh, the story goes that Ben Callan and Ben Ever are two hills in Gress. Once upon a time, Gress belonged to an old woman. She was going to make a will. She had two sons, and this is why one is called Ben Ever and the other Ben Callan. She was going to divide the village. The wall is there. Many people were working on it when the sun was eclipsed and everything went black. The old woman was told a judgment had come upon her. Therefore, no work was done on the wall. It may, seem to, it may be seen today starting at the top part of the stream and stopping out in the middle of the moor. So that's my styles, but this, this is uh, George Stewart's version, which adds a little detail, which is quite good as well. It says, when the McKeevers came to Gress at the end of the 17th century, the Morrisons were taxmen there, and they stayed on for some time after the arrival of the McKeevers. On one side of the wall, we have Ben Callan, and the other side, Ben Ever. It's easy to associate Ben Ever with the McKeevers, and what would be more appropriate than to associate Ben Callan with the Morrisons, with whom Colin was such a popular family name? So did the Morrisons and the McKeevers build this as boundary wall between them some 300 years ago? Tradition tells us why the building of the wall came to such an abrupt end. On one occasion when the work was in progress, about midday, darkness fell and the superstitious workness, workers panicked believing that it was judgment on them for maybe disturbing the remains of a person or persons buried in the area, and they refused to do any more work, and so the wall progressed no further. No such panic would concern us today because <clears throat> in our enlightened times, we would know that the darkness was simply a total eclipse of the sun. This is why it is properly known as the Garan, Gara Mianoi. So just to go back to... Um, the location maps and <clears throat> um, you can see the dark blue line just ends in the middle of the moor there and presumably this is what the traditions are talking about and um it's interesting that that last tradition hints that there might have, they might have dug up a body on the way so there might have been a, a bog body somewhere very close to that end uh, or somewhere along the line um that's that they were feeling guilty about disturbing but the other interesting thing about it is that the other sections of the garag do seen previously had a ditch only on one side of the wall whereas these have ditches either side maybe this is because as the tradition says the midnight wall divided the land between two groups of people and their animals so it was actually a border so it had a slightly different um, function to the garag do regarding the date of the eclipse D.I. researched eclipses visible from Gress and found that an almost total eclipse occurred on the 23rd of September in 1699. This date would fit well with the story because it would be right in the middle of the McKeever-Morrison period. It's great to be able to date one of these features in itself, but it also means that we get a bonus date as it enables us to say that the Garag do, which, both of the, which the Midnight Wall branches off, is definitely older than that. So that means the Garag do is definitely is older than 1699. Um, we also traced another dike farther out into the moor, which runs close to the Karn of Ark, and that's the green line, the green dotted line in this slide. Oh, it, it runs over the Gress River Glen and up to Loch Ulavata Clee. We couldn't be sure. We couldn't be <clears throat> sure exactly what happens to the line of the dike further south, although it's possible that the two merge into one at these lochs, as in these lochs um, bring it together, and then 
the white dashed line uh, is another feature which seems to have been a dike. It consisted of a well, slightly different kind of dike. Again, it consisted of a deep wide ditch. Um, here we go, it, a deep wide ditch um, through the peat, but there's no discernible dike or wall on either side. But if that ditch was deep enough originally, it could have um, definitely been an obstacle or, a, you know, it functioned the same as the dike. The dike continues south into Col and follows the southern riverbank of the Col River down to the sea, as you can see the red line here in this slide. You can, you can see the line of it just to the side of the red line. You can see the same line on the 1852 first edition here, just to the, the you know to the side of the red line again, and then here we go. We're just this is us walking that same line, and you can see there's a ditch either side of this bank, so presumably this one's a border as well. Um. Here you go as well. This is looking the other way out into the moor. And if you look closely right on the horizon, you can see the exact shape of the, the two ditches in the bank in the middle. So it stretches way out into the moor. So this is like, is as we were saying, is a radial line. This is coming out from the village out into the moor rather than concentric. That's another, another shot. So here, so far is a, what we've got, we've got concentric ones in the red, well, the red dash and the green dash and the yellow dash, and then radial lines coming out. Here we go. There's, so there's the radial line. So these seem to be ancient land divisions. So that is... This slide here is the total of uh, all the garag do that we have found and walked uh, this summer. So if anyone out there knows more about these or thinks any of this is wrong and wishes to add their understanding, then please get in touch with the IR and myself and we'll certainly take everyone's information into account. So this is all added with the original picture of Anne Campbell's map of the Western Garrick doing black. And you can see Gress uh, Skiravak uh, Garrick do in the red there. Okay, so that's that sums up the Garrick do so far. Here we're gonna just move quickly on to the shielings. So there were there were so many shielings that we did not manage to properly record them all or even count them all. We were literally tripping up over them. There was obviously so much life that went on out there. However, a few observations can be made. Firstly, we saw many different shapes of shielding, shielding probably dating to different periods, or Ari, uh, dating to different periods. Um, we saw the remains of Bo, or Beehive, a circular shielding with one entrance and permanent corbelled stone roof. Then there was also two forms oval forms of shielding with two doors and removable roof. Then also there was Tayarach or spring house. These are like a mini black house thought to have been built in the early 20th century. And then finally the rectangular corrugated iron version of a shielding with a permanent roof and one door. So in the slide here, the, these are proposed um, evolutions of shielding. Um, there's the Tayarach. This is a drone shot, and there's the most modern, obviously, that everyone knows there. As a type of building, the Ba or Beehive, the earliest form, dates from the Iron Age or as much as 1,500 years ago. Each individual example of a Ba may not be that old, however. We do not know exactly when people changed their style of building and started making the oval form with a removable roof. According to the historian Donald MacDonald of Tolster, there were typically three types of shielding in Lewis. Firstly, the conical Beehive or Ba made of stone covered with turf, without windows and with low and narrow entrances, which could be blocked up. Secondly, the oval adaptations of this design with two low gables and a ridge pole. 
Um, and thirdly, the more modern buildings, similar to the Black House, with the wooden door windows and wall tops. Anne Campbell of Bragger, um, also an authority on the Lewis ceilings, distinguishes four forms from the circular beehives or ba with one entrance and corbelled roofs through two oval shapes with removable roofs and two doors. Firstly, a curvilinear form, which develops into a rectilinear form. What's interesting is um, uh, here in this slide with the red arrow on the shore of Loch Carn, near the Carn of Arc Chamber Tomb on the north bank of the Gress River, we find the remains of a shielding of oval form with the two opposing doors of Anne Campbell's later rectilinear form. The interesting thing about this shielding is that there is no trace, here it is here, there's no trace of this in the 1852 first edition Ordnance Survey, but it is marked upon the second edition surveyed in 1895. So therefore we have a date for its construction between 1852 and 1895, and thereby a date for this example, the example of Anne Campbell's rectilinear form of shielding. It's hoped that further research um, along these lines and observation will help develop a dated chronology from the sequence of change from one form of shielding to the next, which does not exist at present. Okay, uh, illicit still sites. <laughs> <clears throat> so this is the Gress River. The first still site we found was a little way up the Gress River, about half a kilometre downstream of the end of the track that goes out. Um, so here we have it. <laughs> None of us have ever seen anything like it before. You can see, you just make out the low remains of, of turf walls, uh, entirely turf. There doesn't seem to be any stone. And they, they create a little rectangular room set back into the riverbank. Um, here you can see what I mean, yeah. If it had originally been roofed, it would be very hard to spot. This caused us to suspect that it may have been an illicit still. Maybe this was their trick. So, uh, and then also the nearby shielding was extremely well appointed. It had a sprung bed mat, an iron sprung bed mattress, a cast iron stove, would you believe, and other um, you know, examples of luxury. And we wondered possibly, was there a connection between these two? So anyway, I got in touch with an expert on illicit distilling in the Highlands uh, um, of UHI, Dr. Derek Bratt. And he confirmed that indeed, it was very likely to be a still site because he provided pictures um, of these two other sites from the mainland highlands. So there you can see the, the still site is set into the riverbank. They're all built into the riverbank such that when roofed, they would have just looked part of the riverbank. So here's the other one. So then we find more. Um, this is the, on the Alt Kiragol, sorry, Kiragol, just west of New Street. Um, and this little stream was apparently famous for illicit stills. We scoured the river course and found a few possibilities, but only one that was clear. So presumably most of, the, most of them were archaeologically invisible now and practically invisible back at the time. So uh, they were very well hidden. So uh, you can't really make this out very well, but you can see the low remains of turf walls set into the bank there just next to the scale, the meter stick. Um, and so we think that is the site of another still. There you go, you see it a little clearer there. And then finally, this is a still site known from local tradition as told by Seamus MacArthur. It may not look much. In fact, there's nothing at all to inform a passing archeologist that this was once a still site. And therein lies the benefit of local knowledge to archaeology. The story goes that the distillers almost got caught by the excisemen and had to hurriedly bury the copper still. It might even still be there. It was an honour to be shown, shown such a site, and it's perhaps best we don't tell everyone where it is in case someone goes digging it up and looking for the still. Unless, of course, Seaback decide it's a good idea to dig up the still, and then perhaps we could confirm the story and even start a new whiskey. 
Anyway, so finally, I've got a couple of wee mysteries. Um, so this was the first one. <clears throat> this uh, was in a place called Giona Mook, which is partway from Gress round to Tolster. Just there, the red arrow. And these boreholes that we found in the rock, we, we just couldn't understand what these boreholes were for. And we discussed many things. <clears throat> um, one of them was geological samples. And I heard from a friend in Tang of this site, which is on the Tang shore. And you can see these ho holes bored in the rock. <clears throat> and these were bored by geologists from Aberdeen University. And this isn't recorded anywhere. This is just local knowledge that this was the case. But close inspection of these told us that they weren't actually, they didn't actually look the same as the boreholes in Geonomook. Geonomook. So um, we were quite confused. And eventually, Jane MacArthur put a little article in the Lockatuath newspaper um, to ask local people if anyone knew what was going on. And um, this prompted Chrissy Erpeth to respond. Uh, who'd been told that the boreholes were for making lintels, for, for quarrying the rock to make lintels, because, of course, the stone around in Gress is um, conglomerate stone. It's not very, most of it's not very conducive for quarrying into lintels. So this particular geo has a different type of rock, and it was obviously suitable. So that was an excellent little mystery wrapped up. Um, now, here is another one. So this little article, we got this article from the um, archives of the Kominiachty, and um, we'll just read this out. So if you walk along the cliff tops toward the headland, you will notice a fairly large area which has been ploughed. This was one of Lord Lever's experimental schemes. Um, where, what were his intentions? Was he thinking of planting it with something? Nobody seems to know. Further along, you can see a drain, and this is one of the number in that area. There's there's another one starting from the main road near Ben Iver and leading towards the cliffs at Shulavik Vor. Another one can be sent, seen out on the moor on the west side of the main road leading towards Loch Corsavat. These drains were made by the local people during a kind of job creation scheme. In the 1880s, money was allocated by the government to the depressed areas and the work to be supervised by the landlords. They used the money more or less for their own benefit to drain their own pastures. It is said that the wages were six pence a day. So this article seems to su suggest that there's three things. There's a ploughed area, Lord Leverhulme, and then in an early, from an earlier period, there's a drain going from Ben Iver to the cliffs at Sheila Vivor and a drain leading out to Loch Korshavat. So firstly, can you see in this aerial photo, next to the red arrow there, you can see a bizarre area of very straight lines out in the moor. Um, and the map here shows you where that is. So I'm wondering, <clears throat> where are we, you know, is this Leverhulme's ploughed area? It would seem likely, unless anyone out there has any other information, uh, maybe somebody knows exactly what this is, but <clears throat> it, it could be Leverhulme's ploughed area. Now, Secondly, the drains. Um, the, the photograph is, um, is near Shulevig Moor, and you can see the right angle in, the drain, in this big dug ditch. And uh, you can actually see it in the map to the left-hand side. And I'll show you, you, know, you can see it from the aerial photo. You see the, the big straight line and an almost right angle bend. And there's another one just south of it. So they would seem likely to be uh, they would seem very likely to be um, Leverhulme's drains. But then, <clears> there <throat> was another drain. So see in the photograph, this is on the edge of the cliff. There's a, a really deep ditch and a, a bank or a dike on the outside of it. And the red line on the map here shows you uh, the course of this. It goes all the way... Um, from the Sron Rua uh, around the Shulevig Moor, and it goes almost all the way to Glen Tolster. Basically, there's around about um, five kilometres of it. 
it's immense and it's amazing, but it doesn't seem to be a Garag do or a drain because, it, again, it goes uphill, uphill and downhill. Could it be part of Leverhulme's schemes? I don't know because, you know, as we said, it's, it doesn't seem to be a drain. Um, but you would think that something that big would have some sort of historical mention, even monetary accounts for the labour involved. Um, so please, if anyone has any information or ideas about what this uh, enormous undertaking might be, um, please get in touch because it's very interesting and a total mystery. Um, how, there's, there's another mystery prompted by the the wee Kamenyakji article, and that is that the drain, the third thing was there was, it was said there was drains leading out to Loch Korshavat. Now, these sound suspiciously like the Garag do. At least when we were out in the area, we didn't notice two massive ditches in the same area. There was only one, which is what we were thinking was the Garag do. So what was happening there? Also, the Garrick do that we walked, that you can see in the photo here, is already marked on the first edition from 1849. So that was in existence 31 years before the 1880 schemes. So it seems likely that the drains were, that were dug out to Loch Korsovac were actually recutting the, the Garrick do. So when they were getting, the folk were getting paid <clears throat> to, to cut ditches, it seems that maybe possibly they were just recutting the Garag do that was already there. Killing two birds with one stone, perhaps. So again, if anyone has any uh, ideas or further information on this, it would be great to hear it and perhaps solve this little mystery too. Um, and then finally, <laughs> we come to one last mystery. Uh, this is on the top of Krokna Kaurach, which is up the Kol River. Um, all the locals on the walks were as short of ideas as I was. We went round and round in conversation about what this could have possibly been, and no one believed in any idea. So if anyone can tell us what this construction is, we'd be very happy. <laughs> and here we go. There's a wee team photo after the day that we all walked up to Murnag, which was a beautiful day. And um there was lots of lovely photos from the team that I never managed to get in, so maybe on another occasion. And um, thanks to everyone involved. And a few acknowledgements, just that the maps are courtesy of the National Records and the Ordnance Survey. And Chris Murray took some great shots. And Alison Fox took some shots as well that were in there. So thank you very much. Um, and that's it. Good night.